to the House for further consideration. Mr Speaker. I call the Honourable Member, Darian Fenton. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I rise to take a call in the first reading of the State Sector and Public Finance Reform Bill. And I believe my colleagues have laid out our uh, differences uh, with this bill very, very clearly. And I do want to emphasise that we have on the side of the House no problem with the idea of building better public services or whatever slogan the National Party is using at the moment. And there's no doubt about it, there's some good things in this bill. It has a mixture of some good things and some deeply worrying measures. On the one hand, there are the proposed provisions that will enhance whole of government approaches, which should lessen duplic duplication and silo behaviour. We support government agencies working more closely together. We agree with sharing some functions and services, purchasing goods and services jointly and developing systems together in order to best leverage the resources of the state. So I want to repeat for the benefit of the National Party, the National uh, Government, that Labor has, is in agreement with much of uh, many of the provisions that are in this bill. But we have some fundamental differences, and as I said, um, my colleagues have laid them out very clearly. But I intend to um, lay, uh, also repeat the three major concerns that we have with this bill, Mr Speaker, and the reason that we feel that we cannot vote for it uh, tonight. Now, the first concern that we have is the provision that enables the delegation of the functions or powers of chief executives to someone outside the public sector. This could include a contractor in the private sector, and all that is required is the minister's approval. No other test, just the minister's approval. We would like to know why this is being proposed. Why would the functions or powers of chief executives be taken outside the public sector? other than to provide an opportunity for the government to give jobs to their mates or have their mates get more of their mitts on public service decision-making and resources. This change will reduce the opportunity for parliamentary and public scrutiny and it will facilitate privatisation and the government can deny it all it likes but we've seen it in, in the prison service and I think that that's what this is really about because there's no doubt about it, the change would make it easier to contract out statutory functions, it would f fragment services and reduce oversight and public accountability. So that, this is an extraordinary provision, and I, you know, if there is a, if the agenda is not how I've described, Mr Speaker, I look forward to the government refuting that in select committee and meeting our concerns. The second area that I want to outline is the one my colleagues have discussed at length, which is the restriction on the scrutiny applied to ministers and departments. I think we've had a very good description tonight from Clayton Cosgrove and Chris Hipkins about the role of parliamentarians in applying scrutiny um, of, on ministers and departments for the money that they spend, the money of taxpayers they spend and the decisions they make. But instead, we're going to see that scrutiny hard from what I can tell from the bill. And instead of yearly information, strategic information, we're going to get it three yearly. What worries me about these provisions, Mr Speaker, is that it's not a move to better transparency or accountability. And we're, all, we're very concerned about the restriction on access that we're already experiencing. Others have mentioned the Official Information Act. We all know that that process is fraught. Appealing to the Ombudsman is just really hard. You know, if we're trying to, uh, mean, it means an MP's objections just join a very long queue as an under-resourced office tries to cope with the avoidance tactics of this government. We need far more openness, not greater restrictions on the provision of information. And we are very concerned about the implications of this on the estimates and financial review processes. And the provisions are, are far from clear, and I've heard nothing from the government members that give me any assurance about that. There seems to be a trend towards shutting down public debate. For example, the minimum wage consultation uh, was opened up last week. 
The Minister was asked questions by myself about the process and that whether it was changing, and he said it was under Cabinet consideration. That was like a week or two ago. The CTU and Business New Zealand have been advised that they are the only parties that are going to be consulted about the minimum wage review, and there are only three criteria that will apply. They have been given until next week to get their submissions in. Now, the CTU, for example, Mr Speaker, represents 350,000 workers throughout New Zealand, and they are supposed to get a submission in by next week. They've been given about a week and a half. I think that's outrageous, and I think it is deliberately designed to make sure that um, consultation and people having a say is curtailed. <clears throat> I think the most objectionable part of this bill for me is the proposal to establish uh, government workplace, workforce policy orders. These are policies drafted by the State Services Commission that can be made into government workforce policy orders by an order in council on the recommendation of the Minister. These can cover matters such as paying conditions and can apply to a single agency or more than one agency, which could be departments, Crown agents or autonomous Crown entities. So the parameters of collective bargaining, such as paying conditions, will have a level of interference that, we, that is in direct contradiction to our labour laws. It effectively lets the government decree the outcome of bargaining before the process has even begun. I see this as a massive breach of the good faith provisions of our collective bargaining laws and an assault on our international labour and human rights. Why would they do this, Mr Speaker? And I've been puzzling over this. And I do think this bill, and they may have been, this government may have been looking to Wisconsin in the United States, and maybe this is New Zealand's version of Wisconsin uh, abuse of an attack on collective bargaining rights in the public sector. Because Wisconsin mounted a politically motivated attack on its public service workers a couple of years ago, removing from them the right to collectively bargain. Now, the court has just reinstated those rights, saying they viola violated the workers' right to free speech, association and equal protection. Now, we know the government is held built, bent on reducing expenditure in the state sector. Come what may, and we've seen the fallout from that with their stuff-ups in IT and their short-sighted cuts in frontline services. But we also know that state sector workers are highly unionised, and that means that they have become, they are a bit of an obvious target for implementing employment policies aimed at reducing the influence on the overall labour market and cutting wages. And when you put this change together with the government's intentions to change collective bargaining rules uh, for all workers, you can really, it really, the picture starts to come together. It goes hand in hand with the government's plan to gut collective bargaining, to enable new staff to be employed on less paying conditions, enable workers to walk away from collective bargaining and multi-employer agreements to be ditched. So we're very concerned about those three uh, provisions in particular, but around the collective bargaining in the state, wages are already too low in New Zealand. Take away collective bargaining in the state, further weaken unions, then the only left thing uh, that workers will have left to fall back on is the good old trickle-down theory. Uh, we know that didn't work. And I would say, why would any state sector work worker put up with that? They've been demoralised and overworked and restructured to death and undervalued by this government. I think that these provisions are atrocious, Mr Speaker, and that's why we cannot support this bill. Honourable Members, the time has come for me to leave the Chair. This debate is interrupted and set down for resumption next sitting day. The People's House stands adjourned until 2pm tomorrow, the 29th of November. Haere rā, pō marui, good night. Another great day.